Cool. Can you just give me a verbal confirmation that you can see that? Looks good. Okay, thanks so much. All right, so sorry, everybody. I'm gonna kind of start from the top here. So as I was saying uh, before I got cut off, my name is Leah Douglas. I'm a reporter with the Food and Environment Reporting Network, um, where for the past uh, seven and a half months, I've been doing an ongoing data and reporting project on the spread of COVID-19 in the food system. So uh, this presentation is talking about the data analysis that I've done and uh, just drawing some um, analysis out of that data to help us understand how the virus has affected food system workers and the disproportionate impacts in particular on workers of color, which we'll talk about in some detail. Um, so this is a uh, original version of um, the uh, map that I published as part of this project. The first uh, iteration of the map was published in mid-April. And at the time, uh, Fern was uh, first starting to wrap our heads around the breadth of the pandemic, like every newsroom in the country. And uh, we were um, initially uh, doing a lot of coverage um, on the, the, the pressing issue at the time, which for a lot of folks was the question of uh, food shortages, product shortages. We were all concerned that um, you know, the, the products we were used to in the grocery store weren't uh, always accessible when we needed them. And in the course of that reporting, I was uh, started keeping track of one of the issues underlying those um, shortage concerns, which was outbreaks of COVID at uh, food processing facilities um, and which was reducing the capacity of those facilities and, and causing some concern about shortages. Um, in the course of that reporting, it became clear there wasn't uh, sort of one place to go to understand how, you know, how many uh, facilities were experiencing COVID outbreaks, how many workers were sick and sort of what was being done to, to curtail the spread of the virus at that point. So. Um, I started keeping that uh, database, not really knowing, uh, you know, thinking perhaps it would be an issue only in the spring. Um, and it quickly became clear that the virus was spreading, um, not just uh, incidentally in, in food processing facilities, but actually the conditions that workers faced in those facilities um, were, were making those workers particularly vulnerable to contracting COVID. So um, we know that in food and meat facilities um, and on farms, there's a lot of spaces where workers are in very close quarters. Um, you know, there's a lot of extreme temperatures, wet conditions, um, you know, inability to social distance in many cases. So um, it actually became clear that there was something of a, of a connection between um, the facilities that were producing our food and the spread of COVID. Um, so this initial iteration of the map had about 40 um, outbreaks that were in the database, uh, but within, uh, Within just a few months, um, it had expanded to, this was in mid-June, about 400 outbreaks. And uh, we started to see sort of a picture emerge of, um, you know, almost a, a map of where food production happens in the United States. In the Midwest, we saw a lot of outbreaks at the big meatpacking facilities uh, around that region, in the Southeast, um, and the poultry facilities in that region. And in the Pacific Northwest, in California, parts of the Midwest, we saw a lot of outbreaks on farms. and at other types of facilities that yeah, you know, pack fruit, um, salad, frozen foods, um, chips and soda, all those types of uh, food pack packing and processing facilities um, were experiencing outbreaks of COVID. Fast forward to today, um, I've tracked, I've counted over 1200 um, COVID-19 outbreaks at food processing facilities and on farms. Um, and this is the version of the map from today. It changed the visualization somewhat to help us understand um, the varying size of these outbreaks. So um, we've seen a pattern emerge that the biggest outbreaks have occurred in the Midwest at these meat packing plants where there are thousands of workers. And in some cases, the outbreaks um, have you know, sickened hundreds of, of, of workers. Um, and also you know, a lot of um, concentration of smaller outbreaks in regions that have a lot of food processing or farm production. Um, and you know, it's worth noting that there are some regions of the country in this map that are really underrepresented. For instance, in Florida, you know, it, it goes without saying that there's been absolutely more than one COVID outbreak at a farm in Florida. We know that Florida is responsible for a huge amount of our produce production in the US, but uh, you know, this project is, I'm taking a very cautious approach to be sure that all the outbreaks and cases that I'm counting are 100% confirmed either by a public health department or a news report. So, um, you know, there are some places where the state has been less cooperative in um, sharing data um, and where there's been uh, less consistent information available about worker testing and so on. So that's why there's some 
Um, there's uh, lower case counts in some regions where we know that the, the number of workers sickened is, is likely significantly higher. So over time, we've seen a pretty steady, um, you know, rise in the number of cases. This chart shows, you know, um, it's a cumulative chart. So over time, we're seeing cases tick up and up. Um, you know, the, one of the things to note about this chart is, um, you know, the green line, which is totaling all the cases that I've counted. There was, a, you know, sort of the steepest slope in the spring and early summer, which was when the virus was spreading most rapidly in these facilities um, and, and something of a, of a leveling off um, slower uh, rate of increase um, in the early fall. And we are seeing something of a tick up in the number of cases in late November, early December, which is interesting and a little too soon to tell exactly why that might be. Uh, but there's a lot of reasons why the data looks like this. Um, and you know, I, I always encourage folks not to draw too many conclusions from um, the shape of these charts or um, about the underlying data because of, of uh, the inconsistent nature of the data available about, about these um, sectors and these marginalized workers, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But just to give us a sense of where we are in terms of um, the pandemic for food system workers, as of today, um, over 75,200 um, confirmed cases of COVID in this sector, um, about 50,000 of which are, or over 50,000 of which are in the meatpacking sector. Um, and, you know, again, worth noting, I think in particular, the, the farm work sector um, here is, is underrepresented, undercounted um, for a, a large number of reasons, including, um, you know, access to testing for farm worker populations has been inconsistent, say the least. Um, and there's not been great uh, reporting of cases and outbreaks uh, among farm workers. So, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, I've seen some estimates that count, you know, estimate as many as 100,000 or 120,000 farm workers may have contracted COVID. Um, unfortunately, it's, uh, we don't have a specific number for the totality of all those cases. So another aspect of the project has been tracking um, corporate implications of uh, the spread of COVID at these facilities. So, um, you know, there are specific companies, particularly meatpacking companies that have been responsible for the highest number of cases and deaths among workers. Uh, there's been a lot of attention on Tyson Foods, which has the highest number of, of both cases and deaths among their workers, uh, over 11,300 cases as of today. Um, you know, Tyson Foods is the largest meat packer employer in the country, um, but they also, it's also a, a higher percentage of Tyson workers who have uh, contracted COVID than uh, some of its competitors. And, and I have another chart to show that in a second, but um, this bubble chart is helpful for drawing out, you know, which companies are, have been most affected, their workers have been most affected, and, and you know, also highlights some anomalies. Uh, for instance, you know, a company like Foster Farms, which um, wouldn't be first uh, to anyone's mind as the most one of the most uh, powerful meat packers in the country, but has had uh, some, a very high number of worker deaths compared to its peers, especially compared by size. Uh, so, um, you know, it's it's an ongoing effort to see you know exactly how much of an impact um, workers of these specific companies have had. So taking all this data together and just putting it in some context, I've counted outbreaks at about 15% of all the meat packing plants in the country. Again, that's a very conservative, likely underestimate, uh, but that's what the numbers that I have in my database uh, come out to. And that's affecting about 10% of all meat packing workers in the country and affecting meaning that uh, there's confirmed COVID, has been confirmed COVID cases among 10% of, of all meat packing workers in the country. Um, you know, I've had labor advocates uh, worker advocates say to me that they um, suspect that every meatpacking plant in the country has had COVID cases, uh, you know, but again, this is uh, figures are presenting what we what we know for sure and can confirm. Um, and a study by the CDC over uh, using data from the spring that came out in October found that um, in, in all of these food processing sectors, um, food plants, meat plants, and farms, 83% um, of the cases were among workers of color, which is a, a disproportionate um, impact, I think, for the total of all the sectors um, where people of color, workers of color only represent, I think, 47 to 50% of the workforce. So um, that could be signaling, you know, workers of color are in higher risk uh, roles or they're less likely to social, less able, excuse me, to social distance um, or other, it could indicate other um, factors about the types of uh, jobs they're in in these facilities.
And this is just a helpful chart that was done by another outlet using my data that that just draws out um, the sort of uh, you know how what percentage of each company's workers has uh, contracted COVID. Um, you know, which could tell us something about how they're handling the pandemic. Um, I think it's really interesting that um, you know National Beef, uh, which has had a relatively low number of cases, if you're just comparing pure numbers, has had an extremely high percentage of their workforce uh, contract COVID. So. Uh, always important to pull out those percentages so we're you know comparing apples to apples. So I want to talk a little bit about some analysis I've done based on this data um, and uh, talk about some of the underlying issues with uh, with the data as it's being presented both by um, public and private entities. So uh, you know meat packing companies throughout the pandemic and, and all uh, food industry employers, I would say, have had a tendency to be very uh, tight-lipped about uh, the impact that COVID has had on their workforce and also um, the specifics of what they're doing to protect workers from further infection. Uh, so this was a story I did in July, but uh, for the most part, you know, these, these findings hold up, which is the largest meat packers um, and I would say virtually all of the meat packers that have received any type of national scrutiny uh, are not releasing information about, uh, for instance, their own internal worker testing. Um, there was a lot of uh, controversy at the beginning of the pandemic about, um, you know, meat packers in some cases were blocking um, efforts by, by states to get their workers tested in large numbers uh, and, and chose to instead do that testing in-house and, and control themselves, uh, which, you know, on the one hand is uh, more access to testing for workers. On the other hand, uh, it's very difficult to hold those companies accountable to their uh, public health uh, claims and efforts because uh, we don't know how many workers are testing positive in, in those test results. And this continues. Um, Tyson Foods in particular has, has talked a lot. Actually, Tyson, JBS, and Smithfield have all um, spoken about their efforts to test their workers, uh, but have never released consistent information about how many people are testing positive. Uh, and we know from the data that is available in some states uh, where there is a large presence of particularly Tyson Foods that there are absolutely uh, more cases being reported every week, uh, but there's no sort of central uh, way to understand that uh, that's being provided by the companies at least. And, you know, in the public sector, we've had a similar issue with accessing data around how many workers have been affected in this sector. Uh, there, there's not a comprehensive federal um, or state level effort to uh, necessarily even gather information about workplace outbreaks and illness. Uh, every state kind of has its own way of doing things. There are recommendations being made by public health um, experts, but they're not being uniformly followed. So, uh, and there's no federal agency, whether uh, Department of Labor or Department of Agriculture or uh, CDC that's collecting um, you know, workplace specific data in this sector anyway, uh, or in, in these sectors in the food sector. Uh, so the consequence is that's a very patchwork um, way to collect the data as journalists and, and the burden has disproportionately fallen to journalists to try to understand exactly what's going on here. Um, I did a survey over the summer trying to see how many states would uh, release information about uh, the number of, of uh, food system outbreaks and food system workers who had contracted and, and died of COVID uh, and found that just four states were either um, regularly releasing sort of comprehensive information about that data or uh, would release it to me uh, upon request. Um, and that's the four states that are shaded darkest here, Colorado, um, Oregon, uh, West Virginia, and Maine. The rest of the states either didn't respond, those are the grayed out states, to, to the data request, um, or, or provided sort of a, um, a, a partial view into what's going on, whether um, some states are releasing cumulative data about, um, you know, by sector, so X number of meatpacking workers have contracted COVID. Um, some states are only releasing a pure number of outbreaks, so there's been, you know, 50 outbreaks at food processing facilities in this state. And all of those uh, sort of partial views are, um, are inadequate for different reasons and, and keep us from understanding exactly how uh, COVID uh, did spread among these facilities and continues to spread. And as a result, uh, I and many other journalists have had to move into public records requests and really trying to, um, to get the data through other means uh, in the states where it is available. Uh, and just not being shared because we still don't have a comprehensive view even uh, into what was going on in the spring uh, when the spread of the virus was most severe at these facilities. 
And just starting to look ahead a little bit, uh, recently I did a story looking at, um, you know, the big question that a lot of folks were asking at the end of the summer was uh, similar to the question that, that folks were wondering about, um, you know, the spread of COVID in general, which was, there was something of an easing up of, of the virus over the summer, just not to say that by any means, um, you know, it, it was uh, in, a, in a good position, but just to say it was somewhat less intensive a spread. Um, you know, were we going to see a resurgence of COVID in these food processing plants where there were so many outbreaks in the spring? Um, and when I spoke to a number of epidemiologists and public health experts about that, they said that they were concerned about, um, about the potential for the further spread of COVID. Um, there have definitely been lessons learned in the food sector around how to um, prevent the spread of the virus and to keep workers uh, more protected. Um, you know, we're still hearing reports about workers um, needing to reuse PPE, for instance, or uh, especially with uh, having difficulty getting uh, paid time away at the quarantine or receiving accurate information about uh, the state of an outbreak at their facility or whether their coworkers are sick. So there's absolutely still major, major issues um, in some of these plants, but there have been um, industry-wide efforts to you know, roll out more protective equipment, um, to try to stagger shifts somewhat so that there's fewer workers on the floor at the same time. Uh, to try to, um, as I said earlier, implement more uh, regular worker testing. Uh, so, you know, there's been sort of a mixed bag of, as to whether, um, you know, we'll see the same level of, uh, of outbreaks as we did in the spring. I would say from the last, since the story was written in October, um, the month of October, you know, sort of had a relatively low number of new cases in comparison to other months. Uh, but in late November, early December, we are seeing uh, more outbreaks being reported. And a, a number of facilities, at least a couple dozen facilities across the country that are experiencing their second COVID outbreak. So there was a major outbreak in the spring. Um, it eased up either because of, you know, community spread easing up or because of uh, precautions taken in the plant. And now, um, you know, according to public health data news reports, uh, those plants are experiencing a second outbreak. Uh, of course, that's a major concern, both to workers, obviously, but also um, the meatpacking companies, and um, you know, it also can indicate, um, you know, as uh, one thing that's difficult in this current moment of you know uncontrolled spread in basically every state is we know that contact tracing um, has degraded somewhat, and it's become more and more difficult to know where people contracted the virus in the first place, which makes it more difficult for uh, us to understand, you know, the picture for workers uh, in specific facilities and specific sectors. Um, so all that being said, uh, you know, I think it's it's uh, absolutely um, not out of the woods by any means. And, uh, well, you know, we are seeing, um, that, you know, that's sort of um, uh, ticking up in the rate of new cases in the last few weeks. Another topic that's on everyone's mind right now is the COVID-19 vaccine. And, uh, you know, folks, you all might've heard some discussion about where food system workers will, will be in the line um, that we're all in to receive the COVID vaccine. Uh, so I looked at um, plans that states had to put together to, uh, to sort of uh, propose to the CDC how they would roll out a vaccine. And uh, food system workers in most states that I looked at were either in you know, the later first stage after uh, frontline workers and healthcare workers uh, or an early second, second stage or phase of um, rolling out the vaccine. So there was, you know, there's pretty widespread consensus among, um, at least from what I've seen, you know, the food industry, um, labor advocates, uh, public health advocates, et cetera, that uh, food system workers obviously as essential workers and um, having experienced, um, you know, the really severe number of cases that, that they have this year um, should be, you know, early in, in line to access a COVID vaccine. Um, but, you know, when I, when I was speaking with, with advocates and experts about how to, how to get from here to there, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, steps that need to be taken uh, by states and, and local authorities to um, build up trust in particular um, among, you know, between public health departments and workers who uh, not only might have uh, reasons not to trust public health authorities for um, for a wide range of, of reasons, but also during this pandemic in particular have felt to varying extents um, abandoned or, um, you know, uh, you know, we've had a lot of conversations as a country about how essential workers are, are um, you know, have experienced in many ways the brunt of the pandemic. Um, so that's, that's one sort of side of the, of the next few months. And um, another issue that, that came up was uh, the possibility of seeing a vaccine as sort of a, 
panacea or sort of a you know the the one thing that companies um, will do to protect their workers moving forward is to provide the vaccine or advocate for the vaccine, uh, where we know that there are still a, a number of workplace exposure risks um, that you know vac vaccination might not be um, itself the only solution required to to keep the virus under control at these types of facilities. So, um, you know, as we're hearing uh, more and more conversation about the vaccine in the next couple of months, uh, these will be ongoing conversations. And just one last note about looking ahead um, and what we'll what we might see under the Biden administration um, in relationship to specifically how um, how food system workers are um, are uh, how the conditions at these facilities I should say are regulated. Um, one element has to do with uh, folks might have heard some discussion about uh, corporate liability protections that has sort of been a major. Um, sticking point and the Democrats, congressional Democrats and Republicans agreement around the next COVID stimulus package uh, where congressional Republicans want essentially corporate immunity that would provide a shield for, um, for corporations for being sued by workers who had contracted COVID, excuse me, on the job, um, which has been a major issue in the food system. There's been cases brought all over the country uh, workers seeking uh, workers' compensation, seeking uh, you know benefits from, for deceased relatives who worked at um, these facilities, and to try to hold uh, corporations accountable for what they allege are um, you know uh, dangerous workplace conditions. Uh, so anyway, this will be a major topic over the next couple of months, whether or not that uh, corporate immunity shield uh, passes uh, or not, and meat packing in particular is definitely in the middle of all that conversation. Another thing we'll probably, uh, we can say with more certainty, we'll probably see is more uh, more regulatory action in, in OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is the department uh, within the Department of Labor that oversees uh, bringing fines and, and regulating workplace safety. Um, there's been a lot of crit criticism brought against OSHA under the Trump administration during the pandemic for not uh, you know, following up on worker complaints about uh, their exposure to COVID or uh, other negligent workplace conditions. Uh, and there's been very minor fines uh, levied in particular against meatpacking plants and food processing plants where there have been really significant outbreaks and worker deaths. Uh, so uh, the Biden administration uh, will likely increase enforcement in OSHA and uh, will also likely implement um, what's called an emergency temporary standard, which will create some enforceable regulations uh, for how employers should be handling COVID. Right now, um, the, all the guidance is uh, for food system uh, companies anyways, is voluntary. So uh, there's not an enforceable standard there um, where some regulatory action can happen. So these are, you know, it's a little bit wonky, but uh, both these issues are usually important to um, understanding, you know, how workplace safety will change under the next administration, and also what we might, we might see uh, from uh, corporate actors in the next uh, few months or so. That's the end of my presentation, and I would love to take any questions. So you can all put questions either in the Q&A option or in the chat box and I'll read them to Leah. Leah, can you uh, clarify and expand on uh, regulations being voluntary? Yes, absolutely. So essentially at the beginning of the pandemic, um, the CDC uh, and, the D and the Department of Labor uh, released voluntary guidelines for uh, meatpacking employers uh, for how they should protect workers from COVID essentially. So it was essentially a, a long list of suggestions of you know, you could uh, provide PPE, you could, you know, distance workers, you could uh, implement plastic barriers, um, you know, spread, uh, you know, people out in um, locker room facilities or cafeterias, etc. But none of those um, suggestions were required. So there's not an enforceable standard that needs to be met by every food system or in this case, meatpacking employer 
um, to keep uh, workers protected in a specific way from COVID. And that's been really controversial. Um, and a number of states have actually passed um, state legislation that supersedes uh, or goes further than that federal action that does implement requirements. There's There's been a couple by sector. So um, some states that have said specifically for farm farm employers, um, and you know that that came up a lot over the summer when we um, had the highest number of migrant workers in the country and farm you know the harvest season's underway. Um, and there are a few states that have specifically uh, discussed it around and and some implemented it around uh, meat packing. This was actually there was some news about this today in North Carolina where there's been a huge effort to try to get. Um, the state to to pass some voluntary, I mean, excuse me, some mandatory um, uh, worker safety guidelines for meat packing plants in, in the state. Um, and the state this week said they essentially didn't um, didn't see COVID as a specifically occupational hazard, um, which is sort of the, one of the questions that issue. Um, but of course, labor advocates would say that um, when folks are contracting COVID on the job, that it has become an occupational hazard that didn't previously exist. Uh, but anyway, so that's that's what might shift under uh, Biden. We'll have to see. You know, he Biden himself made some commitments around um, around enforceable standards and more regulatory action. Um, but we'll have to see uh, what the appointments look like in OSHA and whether there's follow through on that. Thanks, Leah. Um, the next question is, has your relationship to your profession slash journalism changed due to COVID and how so? That's a great question. Um, yes, definitely. This is by far the most long-term and um, long-term project I've worked on and also the first data project that I've worked on. I think it's been really eye-opening to, to see how, um, you know, collecting information and doing analysis based in numbers and, and uh, hard data is uh, really different than um, you know the type of reporting I'm used to, which is more investigative or news reporting. Um, and I think it's it's been really eye opening to see, in particular, how difficult it is to get um, that hard data from public um, entities. You know, it's been disappointing to some extent um, to see how many public health departments are unwilling to to share data or have to be FOIAed, um, and the FOIA process is very labor intensive and not always fruitful. So. Um, that's definitely been eye-opening and not necessarily a great way. Thanks for the question. Did you find the farm outbreaks to be on larger farms, e.g. those that use H1A workers? That's a great question. You know, I would say this is just based off the top of my head because um, I haven't done that analysis, but uh, I would say I haven't seen a huge correlation in, in farms uh, between the size of the farm and the number of outbreaks. There are a lot of outbreaks on small, you know, small farms. So, you know, relatively small, low number of cases, um, maybe a dozen or fewer cases, um, you know, which might be all of the workers on a specific farm, uh, but the farm itself is not employing that many people. Um, that being said, you know, there is a huge dearth of information, like I was saying in that sector, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was um, if there actually was a correlation there, it's just not visible because the information hasn't been collected either by the state or um, isn't being made available by the state. Uh, so unfortunately, I'm not, uh, I'm not quite sure. My, my instinct is from the data I have, I haven't seen that, but the correlation could be there. Have you looked into numbers among grocery store slash market workers? I have not. I uh, just didn't structure the database that way, um, in part uh, because I was really trying to orient the projects around pr the production side. Um, but you know, there are some states that are releasing information, and that the, um, the UFCW, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, which represents a lot of um, grocery workers, was keeping their own tally for a number of months of how many of their members had contracted COVID. I mean, that's a subset of. Um, the total, you know, workforce because not everyone has the union, um, but uh, but they did have some figures on that. Um, I have a couple of like distribution centers for um, bigger, you know, for grocery stores like a Safeway distribution center, Walmart distribution center, um, which uh, you know, but just drew the line after that. Um, so I have not been collecting that. Do you think that state's unwillingness to share data is due to the politicization of COVID or is that something you've run into with other issues you've covered as well? 
That's another great question. You know, I think, um, you know, I would say in general, there's, it, it's a mixed bag. It really depends on what state. I mean, my, my, my experience prior to this was that it really depends on, on which state you're dealing with. Um, you know, some states are really happy to, to share data. Some counties within states are much more cooperative than the state itself or respond much more quickly um, to data requests. Uh, but definitely for the specific information around, um, you know, workplace outbreaks and how many um, workers have been, uh, have contracted COVID, you know, by company, that's been so politicized in, in many states um, where, you know, the business interests, whether it's, um, you know, just the local business council or even the meatpacking industry, specific industries have really been applying pressure to, you know, local and state public health departments not to release that data. Um, and, you know, I would say one of the, yeah, so that, that's, that's a new dynamic, I would say. And it does not just uh, happening in the food system, you know, it, it affects um, private employers, you know, disclosure of outbreaks at private employers of all kinds. Um, but in many states, one of the most vocal um, sectors is the meatpacking or the food processing um, or farm sector um, is not to share that data. So, um, you know, there's actually been some states where public pressure either from the media or from public health officials to release information, um, you know, has been successful where the state begins to release more data about um, workplace outbreaks and then after sort of backlash from, uh, you know, private private industry or uh, business interests, uh, you know, changes or rolls back some of that transparency, um, which I've reported on a little bit. Um, and, you know, it's, it's disappointing to see that happen when, you know, um, the, the universal um, call from public health experts is to make as much of this information available as possible so that um, everyone in the community has a clear, as clear a picture of where there are outbreaks. And I would say it's safe to say that there's almost no, there's maybe two states in the country where you would log on to their COVID dashboard and have a really clear sense of where there's been outbreaks in the past and where there's a currently active outbreak. Um, otherwise, it's sort of a hodgepodge of partial information. So absolutely, you know, um, where it's, it's not necessarily easy to get information from states otherwise, I would say, you know, getting specifically workplace COVID information has definitely become politicized, yeah. Awesome, we have a few more minutes if there are any other questions. If not, I think that might be it. Leah, are you on the YFCC app? Yes. Awesome. So I think if anyone, you know, wants to follow up with you, they'd have the opportunity to do so there. Yeah, please do. And thanks so much. Sorry again for my technical difficulties. All right. Thank you. Everyone have a good night.